You know, I feel like string players have a love with cashmere. I've seen other people adapt it, other string, you know, or orchestras adapt it. And, you know, and it's, so it's really fun to finally be like, I want to put my spin on this song. And it's such a classic. It always utilized strings in it. And so it's yeah. kind of like a, I feel like it's a rock anthem that's made for string players. That's violinist, dancer, and composer Lindsey Sterling talking about her latest release, a cover of Led Zeppelin's 1975 hit, Cashmere. We got to talk to Lindsey about that and much more just before soundcheck on her current tour. I'm Ian, and this is Music and Artists, a show for and about musicians. We're about to jump into the conversation, but first some background, in case you don't know. Lindsey Sterling is an American violinist, songwriter, and dancer. Sterling's choreographed violin performances are a unique blend of classic pop, rock, and electric dance music. Now, having surpassed 13 million subscribers and 3 billion views on her YouTube channel, Lindsey's impact is undeniable. With six albums under her belt and the seventh on the horizon, Lindsey's talent even goes beyond music as the author and creator of her comic book series, Artemis. She's got platinum-selling records, award-winning music videos, and even a daytime Emmy nomination. Lindsay has just wrapped up a U.S. tour and gearing up for an encore of her Snow Waltz Christmas tour. Dang, she's busy, which is why we are so lucky she had time to sit down with us. Check it out. You obviously had a, like a classical training in the beginning before the, the you know, you know, awesome and unique Lindsay Sterling style manifest. Like, how important was it to have a classical training first before you developed your own unique vibe? Oh my gosh, I am so grateful for my classical training. And I always tell that advice to like kids when they ask me like at meet and grades, like, what's your best advice? And I'm like, it's probably not what you want to hear. But like those classical roots and that foundation is invaluable. And, you know, even though I play a lot of different types of music and I'm, you know, a little more experimental, I still practice classical music. And actually tonight in the show, I'm playing a classical piece. I spent five months preparing it. It's wow. a Toccata and Fugue, which is a bit of a burner for a violinist. Um, but I love that I can still lean into classical music and, yeah. you know, use that repertoire because, you know, there's a reason that that music has been played for hundreds of years. Had you not had musical training at a young age and been stuck with music for so long? Like, what is Lindsay Sterling's life minus music? A great question. I don't know quite who she would be without music. It's been such a staple of my life for as long as I can remember. And I think um, but I think at the core of it all, I'm a, I'm a creative soul. And so I know I would be doing something creative, you know, because I love everything from the music, of course, to the costume design, to the, you know, the creation of the show and the, you know, I, I don't know, anything that can be creative, um, you know, even video editing. So I, I would be doing something yeah. creative. Were there other, do you think there are other things in your life like, oh, because of music, I'm now good at this or is effective discipline or how I learn or things like that? I mean, all the things for sure. I feel like music is the the foundation of where all the creativity starts for me. Yeah. For sure. Editor. I feel like I'm a better editor because of that. Um, but also even um, what other things? Oh, also, I've gotten into aerial arts and having musicality. Because um, really you're like the tall. Tom Cruise of violin <laughs> Oh, yes, that's what everybody says. <laughs> but yeah, I think that any of the disciplines I've leaned into, it's really always helpful to have a musicality flow to the different things. I read that you were like a non-traditional learner, like with, with, with school and stuff like that. Like for me, like my, one of my kids and, and myself, my aunt, were all dyslexic. And and I think I went into a creative avenue and in more visual, but because of that unique way of learning, atypical. I read that you had similar you yeah. know, experiences. Like how, no, I, what I, kind I, of bridges and tools that you explored? Yes, I as well am dyslexic. And and I also have like this thing called cross dominance. So I, I had multiple learning disabilities. And, you know, as a child, I remember it making me feel very dumb. Like I just thought that I wasn't smart and, you know, and I know that so many kids deal with that when you're doing the popcorn reading around the class and the anxiety that creates right. in like a child when you just know you can't read. And I was one of those kids. Um, and 
also that affected my musicality because if I can't read words on a page, I sure as, you know, I can't read notes and little tiny dots on sheet music. And I remember thinking, oh, this is going to make it so I don't think I'll ever be able to be a professional if I can't read what they plop in front of you as a classical violinist. Sure. That's, that's a game changer. However, it made me forced to learn music through different means. And I developed an incredible ear. Like if I could hear things, I could learn to play them and I could pick them up super fast. It also made it possible for me to memorize music so fast because I could not rely on that piece of paper. I had to rely on my mind. And, you know, and then the way I've gone with music, it's been such a helpful tool. It's helped me be a better writer. The fact that I can hear things and hear nuances and, you know, this training of this atypical learning that I had to learn in school, obviously, right. but also in my music, it's really helped me think in a different way. And I think it's really what made the creative muscle in me so strong. When you were getting into music at a young age, was it always going to be violin? Was there another instrument that you considered or was it like violin or nothing? I was always a violinist, you know, yeah. like that was the instrument I immediately gravitated to. And in high school, just for fun, I dabbled with some other things. Like I played the flute for a bit and the piccolo. And but yeah, I always knew that violin was like my language. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I read that when I think it was like middle school or something, you when you went to your first full size violin, like there was a transit, like a pivotal transition point where like the full size violin was like a like a breakout upgrade. Yeah. Tell, tell me how that felt. Like, what was that like, like experiencing your first full size violin and the difference that that made? Yeah. I mean, I think anytime you get like a, a new instrument that's special and the first time I ever owned a violin was that full size violin that I got in, in junior high. And I remember just being so excited. It was the nicest violin I'd ever owned. And so being able to experience the nuances that a better instrument can have. And then I remember also the first time I bought like my professional violin, you know, like my parents helped me. I used all my savings and like really invested into this instrument that I still have. Its name is Excalibur. But I remember just the power that that gives you as a musician when you get an instrument that allows you to find nuances that you didn't know you could have, you know, because you can only play as well as your instrument can right. match you, right. you know, um, I think with anything. Yeah. And so, you know, it's like, I always describe it as like Harry Potter, like choosing yeah. his wand, like this yeah. violin comes to you and it almost chooses you. And I, I still feel that way when I try new instruments. Yeah. And yeah, it's a really special thing. I started to grin real big when you said the, the your, you named the violin Excalibur because we were actually talking in the drive over here. We're like, do you think she named her violin? Like when we were trying to guess like what we thought it would be. And we didn't guess Excalibur, but like, of course, it's Excalibur. <laughs> like, weapon, you know? Yeah, it's like very a good. Uh, I name all my violins. So we've got, on this tour, we've got Excalibur, we've got Cleopatra, we have Arwen, and um, Bob Ross. Nice. Yeah, those are the violins we've the got. happy trees. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's cool. Well, okay, so when did you jump to the electric, to electric violins? Like, how, what was that jump like? And yeah. And the difference did that be? It was actually in high school. I joined a rock band when I was, like, I think 15 or something, and I remember my mom would come to these like little shows like Battle of the Bands or like house parties. My parents would come to like support and listen. <laughs> and my mom was like, I can't hear you at all. You know, because I'm up like real close to like a microphone that we just angle down. I'd try sure. to play as loud as I can, but you can't compete with like electric guitars and such. Right. And so um, I remember my mom was finally like, I'm sick. I can't I'm like being able to hear you. And so she took me down to like Milano's music and they had one electric violin there and you know, and they bought it for me. And um, that was a pretty exciting thing to be able to, for the first time, like, oh, put reverb on it. And, oh, I can put distortion on it and just kind of find a whole new cornucopia of yeah. exciting things. And as much as I love my electric violins, I'm such a such a sucker for the natural sound. You can't yeah. beat the sound of a wooden violin. Um, but for shows like this where I'm dancing around and jumping and the, so loud on stage, like the electrics is definitely the way to go. Cool. And the, and the ones used on stage now, those, those those are the Yamaha? Yes. Can you tell, tell me a little bit like what the difference that the Yamaha electric violin makes compared to others? Like why why the, the Yamaha that you play? Yeah. Um, I mean, I that's actually the only electrics really I've ever performed with are Yamaha ever since I was a teenager. Cool. Um, and I do just love the sound. I think they have the closest um, to a natural sound where it can pick up a lot of the nuances. Some of them are so strongly electric that you don't get really any dynamics. And I feel like Yamahas do the best job of picking up the nuances, in my personal opinion. I've seen some of your TikTok videos and some of your YouTube videos where you see young players in your audience. I think you had a poster like they're upstaging me or something oh, like that. Yeah. And, but clearly you have, you are very inspiring 
a young musician or even an adult musician is inspired to pick up the violin or another inspiration, like a Lindsey Sterling fan is like, that sounds so cool, I want to do that. How do they stick with it, stick with the classical trainings, you know, find the endurance, and what do they do when they hit burnout before throwing in the towel? Yeah, I mean, I definitely, when I was growing up, hit burnout several times, and I'm really grateful to my mom who, um, you know, when I hit those moments and when I was like, I don't want to play anymore, you know, I'm, I'm bored or I'm burnt out or whatever. She would always encourage me. She would say, well, okay, can you just play for another three months? And if you want to quit at the end of the year, you know, be my guest, but just, you know, for me, do it for three more months. And I'd always be like, okay. And as long as I had that thought in my mind that I still had the choice to quit, you know, it's not like my mom was forcing me, right? Um, but she just was kind of asking me like, for me, do it a little longer. And then by the time I'd reached that like three month marker, it's like I didn't care to quit anymore because I'd made it through the hurdle or the hump. And, you know, even as an adult and learning new skills, um, you know, I, I've taught myself to dance when I was in my 20s and I learned aerial acrobatics when I was in my 30s. And it can be so discouraging. And I think it's a little extra hard to learn something new as an adult because we're not as patient with ourselves. We also know what we're good at and you like to stick with the things that are comfortable at this point. And, um, you know, and so just from my experience in learning things as an adult, it is so extra gratifying to make it through those hurdles. And you do go through those times when you're like, I'm not getting any better. And obviously I shouldn't learn something new. This yeah. is too hard. Obviously I'm not good at this. But when you make it through that, like that hurdle and suddenly it starts to click as an adult, it's really gratifying to realize the you know, that compensation of like, I can do new things. And um, it's been really rewarding to learn things as an adult. So any of the adult musicians out there that are just starting and they're discouraged, you know, of course, of course you suck. You just started. Of yeah. course I sucked at hoop. I just started, you know? And yeah. um, so I just want to encourage those people to awesome. stick with it. Your influences in the music that you've covered and created, like I was looking at the, the Artemis books and there's like a like kind of a cyberpunk blood Blade Runner vibe going through for me like when I see it. Um, obviously you've done video game covers and movie covers, lots of, mu uh, Christmas music. Like you have a very, uh, eclectic yeah. uh, set of influences. Well, thank you. I, I mean, I think it's awesome. Um, <laughs> at the same time, kids are playing video games like all day, every day, and people are getting sucked into social media. Like, how do you find the balance to, to use the good things in TikTok and the good parts of video games, but not let it consume your life all the time and still practice your craft and become a good musician? How do we keep making musicians and not just kids that just want to do social media? And video? Yeah. I mean, it's actually a really hard balance. I think that the balance of life for everyone is getting just harder and harder constantly. Yeah. There's so many competing influences all the time. And how do you find the, ver you know, the balance between them? And, you know, as a professional musician, I even have to sometimes stop and remind myself that like, I am a violinist first and foremost. I am not a TikToker. And I, even though that has become such a huge part of my business and how I have to survive as an artist, you know, I have to remind myself like, oh, what I actually do is I perform, I play. That all is secondary because it is really easy to get sucked into like always thinking of like, what's the next social media thing? What's the next thing? Well, how do I get this song viral? How do I do this? And it's like, well, you know, it's constantly reminding myself of the balance between the two. And you have to find that balance between the real world and the online world. And I think today it is important to have both. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just always kind of stopping, reevaluating and being like, have I gone too far to one end or the other? Because I always want to find myself somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Well, we're, we're very lucky that you have, because I think because you deviated from just being a traditional violinist and just, you know, sticking to the script and found your own voice. Now we have an example for other people that want to pick up the violin or another classical instrument. And like, you, you don't have to just do what the book says. You can learn that foundation and then. And you can go anywhere with it, you know? And like last night we had, we've been doing this thing at some shows where I've had, you know, um, people join me on stage. I've picked someone in the audience to come up and join me. And last night we had a saxophone come up oh, cool. and he just wailed on that thing and did the coolest solo in the middle of our set, like in the song. And, you know, and it just is so cool to me to just see people doing their own thing with their instrument and taking it into new avenues and making it them. And there's so many ways to make it you, whether it's from the way you present it on social media, whether it's the kind of music you decide to fuse it with, whether it's like what you wear and how you present your personality through your aesthetic. Like there's so many ways to take instrumentation and make it fun and 
unique to the person and really let your voice shine through. And I think that was the most beautiful thing for me when I first started to like really dive into my style was realizing, oh, this violin I played my whole life. I've never really made her me. And now I get to discover how to make the violin fit me rather than me fit the violin. And I think that's when everything changed for me. There was a, a commentary I read recently, you know, AI obviously has exploded the past six months. Right. And there's lots of conversations. What, what is it going to do to entertainment and music and things like that? But I, I think one of the interesting takeaways I heard from one commentator, despite some of the scary stuff from AI, is you can't deny what someone does in person on a stage right in front of you. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, seeing something on a screen that may or may not be real is one thing. Well, and that doesn't discredit all the talent and effort that went into your for music. For sure, for but sure. to see you hang from the <laughs> ceiling while playing the violin in person isn't fake. That's really happening. So, right. you know, thank you for, for still doing that and inspiring other people to do that and or, or find their version of that because I think it's important to uh, to have real experiences. Absolutely. And, yeah, the AI thing is sometimes just, like terrifying to think about or what it's going to change our world into. But you're, you're right. There is something about just real human to human experiences that um, every job has their version of it. And I think that's what's going to keep us even more attuned to it. It's going to become even more special the more we start to see stuff that's not real. Just a couple of days ago, I guess it's been a couple of weeks ago, I think Apple knows what I like between the musical scores that I listen to and, and other popular music. Because as soon as Cashmere dropped, it was like front of my recommended oh, list. Yes, that's amazing. <laughs> what, what to hear it. Yeah, I loved it. What? what 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 inspired you adapting cashmere? Like why why cashmere? Why now? You know, I feel like string players have a love with cashmere. I've seen other people adapt it, other string, you know, or orchestras adapt it. And, you know, and it's, so it's really fun to finally be like, I want to put my spin on this song. And it's such a classic. It always utilized strings in it. And so it's yeah. kind of like a I feel like it's a rock anthem that's made for string right. players. Is is this vibe, the cashmere vibe, like a taste of some more? Like, is the next album going that direction? You know, there is a more a bit more rock influence on my upcoming album. Definitely not as far as like we went full like rock all the way to the wall as much as we could with cashmere. And so the the next album isn't quite that heavy rock. Um, but I do love rock, and so I love to like experiment yeah. in it. Like through the years, ever since I did like a rock Phantom of the Opera. When I was just beginning, you know, I, every few years I like to do just a pretty heavy nice. Michael Cox song. What's next? What's what's the next big thing on the Lindsey Sterling horizon? What is next? I I don't know. I you I mean, know you're focusing on a tour. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I'm working on a new album that comes out next year. Sometimes when people ask me like that question of what's next, it's such a big question. And I have so many like little goals and big goals and things I want to achieve. But at the same time, I'm like, I also have to remind myself, I'm so grateful to be like right where I'm at, you know? I, and I, this tour just kicked off and, and I'm like, I still love it. I still get so excited to go out there and perform. And, you know, and to me, I'm like, that's the dream. Like that is the dream that I'm, I'm really happy where I'm at, even though I've got other goals and stuff. Thank you so much to Lindsay Sterling for sitting down with us. Lindsay is currently on tour and you can learn more at lindsaysterling.com. Special thanks to Yamaha for making this episode possible. If you enjoyed this episode, and we hope that you did, be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll endeavor to make more episodes just like this one. Oh, I got a meeting. Owen, oh, read us out. This episode was produced by Melissa Reyes, Ian Scott Pullins, and Owen Rye. Editing by Jake Cross at Red Pixel. Additional production support by Liam Pullins. Music and Artists is presented by your source for instruments, lessons, rentals, and repairs. Music and Arts. Musicians made here.